get started. Um, thanks for coming to uh, the last and potentially best lecture of the semester. <laughs> Um, our lectures and uh, planning series. Um, today we have Erin McElroy. Um, Erin McElroy earned their doctoral degree in feminist studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz, um, with their dissertation project entitled Unbecoming Silicon Valley, Techno-Imaginaries and Materialities in Post-Socialist Romania. Um, this project analyzes the politics of space, race, technology, and displacement in Romania and Silicon Valley, as well as modes of resistance and deviance. Um, Aaron is also co-founder of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, a counter-mapping and digital storytelling collective that documents dispossession and resistance struggles under gentrifying landscapes, uh, focusing on the San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, and New York City. Um, recently, Erin co-founded the new Radical Housing Journal, a peer-reviewed journal bringing together scholar, activist, housing justice work transnationally. Um, currently, Erin is a postdoctoral researcher at NYU's AI Now Institute and is in the midst of launching a new project that investigates the artificial intelligence behind property technology, looking to the uh, unfolding of data and property regimes. Um, and today, Erin will be presenting her talk on the ethics and data of mapping displacement on the work of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. So with that, uh, welcome, Erin. Yeah, thanks, Wendy, for the introduction. And thanks for being here and letting me talk with you all, hopefully not just to you. So please, um, I want this to be a conversation and not just this, this didactic lecture. So please interrupt me. If something doesn't make sense, let me know, and hopefully it will be a, a generative 40-minute um, or so presentation. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I am one of many people involved in this project called the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project that I'm going to focus on today. Um, we are a counter-cartography collective and um, data visualization, data analysis uh, collective that's been producing work to um, fight evictions and gentrification, uh, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area um, since 2013. Um, two years ago, we launched a new chapter in New York and LA. Um, those chapters are newer, um, but now that I'm in New York, I'm able to plug into the New York one. Um, but we're a pretty horizontal group, so I'm gonna be showing a lot of work today that's not just mine, it's collective work, so I just really wanna to make that known. Um, but I also wanna contextualize it um, alongside some, some recent work that I've been doing on property technology and the sort of data practices that landlords in the real estate industry are using um, in order to do kind of the opposite of what we're trying to do. So we're working to collect data and produce tools and technology for housing justice, and I want to position this in this landscape in which um, real estate speculators and landlords are producing data and maps for housing injustice and how we're trying to to think about the ethics of mapping displacement um, in that landscape, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Hopefully it does. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit first about actually the platform real estate technology and, and data that's being pro produced for housing injustice, then get into the work of the mapping project, um, and then wrap it up with a little conversation on, on data ethics. And some of this new work that I've been doing um, at the AI Now Institute, um, where I'm doing this postdoc, um, is also being done in collaboration with a geographer named Desiree Fields, who some of you might know, um, who now teaches at UC Berkeley and has been studying platform real estate for some, some time now. Uh, we're currently working on a, an international project looking at um, property technology and platform real estate. Um, and I'm, I'm supposed to focus on the US, which is <laughs> no easy task. She's been looking at this in Berlin lately. Um, but just to kind of contextualize, there's this emergent field of property technology, or some people are calling it platform real estate, um, that really began maybe around 2012, 2013. It's about an $18 billion uh, global industry right now, and Wall Street seems to be its epicenter. Um, I've been attending some of these prop tech conferences and trying to, to learn from some of the insiders, but also I've been working with some tenants who have been fighting its various instantiations um, in, in New York. So this is kind of how I'm grounding myself in, in this New York space right now. Uh, I'm gonna kind of go through this relatively quickly, so just raise your hand if something doesn't make sense, um, because I wanna get to the mapping project work as well. Um, but, you know, platform real estate, is it's not just the, the sort of digitization of um, real estate listings, it's, there's this whole way, and various ways, really, that um, the real estate industry is 
is now trying to catch up. There's this idea that real estate's this legacy heritage industry and now it needs to catch up so that it can um, take advantage of this, this new tech boom era that we're in, um, which means using IoT, artificial intelligence, um, and various databases and, and data collection modes, data brokerage modes in order to collect data around property, right? Um, which can also kind of lead to, to real estate funneling money into these various types of management um, and, and development and, and kind of looking at housing now as a service. Um, there's this idea that we need to, ho I guess the hotelization or amenitization of housing is where real estate should be funneling its money because that's, um, that's what millennials want. That's, that's the idea that you can find um, circulating in a lot of kind of strange prop tech conferences that might have panels like this. Um, this was a conference that I went to um, on Wall Street uh, a few months ago. So you can just sort of, you don't need to read all of this, but get a sense as to where the industry is headed right now and how the industry is thinking about data and technology. Um, in New York, some of you might have heard, there's been a lot of pushback against one form of prop tech in particular, um, facial recognition um, of property technology that really came to a head uh, over this last year in Brooklyn and Brownsville, where a uh, public housing complex, Atlanta Plaza Towers, it's a 718 unit building, um, or really two buildings. Um, the landlord, Robert Nelson, decided he was going to install facial recognition technology um, from this Kansas-based tech company called Stonelock. And the idea was that tenants would have to give up their key fobs and replace them with, um, or basically instead subject their faces to this, this weird um, biometric heat wave mapping um, that Stonelock has produced. Um, Stonelock apparently contracts with 40% of all uh, Fortune 500 companies and has various ventures uh, globally. This technology never was installed in Atlantic Plaza Towers because the tenants organized and fought back, but apparently it has already been installed in other locations in New York um, without tenant consent. Um, and there's, there's this other FST21. It's um, another facial recognition um, kind of technology that uses motion detection that's already been installed in Knickerbocker Village in the Lower East Side. Um, and you know, Atlantic Plaza Towers, it's a predominantly, um, uh, well, both buildings have predominantly tenants of color, mostly women, Atlantic Plaza Towers is predominantly black, um, Knickerbocker Village is mostly Asian American, uh, and many tenants are immigrants. Um, the company that invented this uh, particular software has contracts with the IDF and comes from a military background, so a lot of tenants are worried that their data is being given to ICE. Um, tenants in Atlantic Plaza Towers were worried that their, their data would be given to the police. Um, and we know already that a lot of this technology disproportionately works on white men and, and not women and not people of color. So the tenants in Knickerbocker Village have been talking about how in order to get into their building now they have to do these humiliating dances in order to be seen and, and enter their buildings. Um, there is a um, company called Tiemann, um, made by this comedian named Ari Tiemann from New York who's installed um, this facial recognition doorman, as he calls it, um, called Gate Guard in over 700 buildings in New York right now. Um, most of them, though, are higher end buildings where people actually want this because they see it as a perk. Um, and yet, he's th this is this weird mailing um, team and sent out to a bunch of landlords recently that looks like a joke, but he's actually saying that if you install this, this strange doorman thing, <laughs> um, it can help you get rid of tenants that you might not want and raise rents and, and reduce um, rent stabilized housing and turn it into to market rates. So, so it's not lost on the people inventing some of this that um, it can be used in order to raise rents and, and revenue. Are the facial recognition software mostly being installed in public housing or is there like a difference? That's the thing. So this stuff, I mean, it's some of it's being installed in high-end like market rate and luxury housing because people think it, of it as a perk. You don't have to have a key anymore because you have your face. Um, but in the case of Atlantic Plaza Towers or Knickerbocker Village, um, it was public and then affordable housing. Um, and so it's sort of interesting how it gets rolled out and if we can have a long conversation around the ethics of how it's rolled out. Um, so I think part of, yeah, that's part of what I'm, I'm maneuvering towards. 
Um, yeah, and so Tiemann um, also has this um, database platform called Property Panels XYZ. Uh, he also has this, this thing called Sublet Spy. Um, but Property Panels XYZ um, integrates with his um, facial recognition hardware and this, this sublet spy tool he created in order to detect illegal sublets. Um, so that if you install one of his cameras, any data that that camera gathers is going to get integrated into this database system. And then he can offer landlords um, access to this database system to, to learn more about tenants and whether or not they might be illegally subletting, in which case he suggests that they be evicted. So it's this kind of new way that data and surveillance is being enacted by the real estate industry through technology in order to raise rents and, um, and, and yeah, get rid of tenants that are paying less. Um, in San Francisco, this looks really weird, but there's actually this company called Poo Prints <laughs> that um, landlords are using um, to mandate that tenants' dogs get DNA tested. And then if dog poop is found on a property and can be linked to the dog of a, a tenant, that tenant can get a fine or get evicted. So it's biometrics, not through facial recognition, but through DNA testing of animals, which is like this whole other very strange domain that I never thought I would be um, entangled in, but this is, this is currently being rolled out in at least 100 properties in San Francisco right now. Um, yeah, there's a company in Maryland that now has automated eviction notices, so you don't get evicted through paper eviction notices, but through um, an app. Um, and the list goes on. Um, one big company called CoreLogic, maybe some of you know about it, it's, it, does, it doesn't offer facial recognition or biometric testing, but what it does offer is information to landlords and property owners and property managers um, about properties and about tenants. Um, it currently claims to have information about 99% of all parcels in the US, I think also Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, going back 50 years. And for $20,000, you can access it and learn about your, your property or property you might want to acquire. Um, but you can also learn about potential tenants. Um, they have these, these kind of bundles that they offer, um, such as registry crime safe and crime check. Um, that can alert landlords if tenants are, um, in, in their, this is their language, criminals or terrorists. Um, and they're currently being sued um, in Connecticut because of the racist implication of this. Um, but this just kind of, this, this magnifies something. Tiemann's only working in New York. This is a, a sort of global network of data collection being used by the real estate industry right now um, in order to, uh, yeah, bolster it and, and kick out tenants that are undesirable or, or prevent them from moving in in the first place. Um, and then probably folks have been following, but on a national level, we have um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, now proposing an alteration to interpretation of the 1968 Fair Housing Law, which um, has what was a civil rights era law to prevent racist discrimination in housing and basically the proposal that, that Trump rolled out was that um, if a third party algorithm is used uh, that results in, in racist discrimination, then the landlord's not responsible because it's an algorithm and that's not the landlord's fault. So this sort of makes uh, the federal government the ultimate like, champion of, of racist property technology. Um, and maybe folks have been following um, tools such as Amazon Ring, which has now partnered with over 400 police departments in the US um, to offer information about um, potential uh, criminals, again, uh, to, to the police. Um, so there, the sort of entanglement of, of private and proprietary software, hardware, database systems, et cetera, with police, ICE, um, and, and the federal government in general is real and very complicated and something new that, um, it's new and it's old, but some of, the, some of the actual technology is new. These relationships are, are old and well and alive, right? Um, but I wanted to, to switch gears now. I first learned about PropTech actually when I was in Romania where I was doing research for a lot of my dissertation project, um, which was about how Western tech companies are leading to the gentrification of particular cities in Romania, such as Cluj, 
um, which is in Transylvania, um, and has been recently recognized as this new like Silicon Valley of Eastern Europe. Of course, it's not, but there are you know hundreds of Silicon Valleys around the world right now that have these aspirational politics of um, being recognized as Western. Uh, Cluj is really um, the center of a lot of outsourcing for Western tech companies. Um, and I was doing a lot of interviews with people who work night shifts for, for Western tech companies like Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, et cetera, but also looking at how these outsourcing firms are contributing to the gentrification of Cluj. Um, and I realized that a lot of people in, in Cluj are actually working the night shift for this company called Yardi, which is a prop tech company um, that manages the property for all of uh, Blackstone, which is, as probably folks know, like the, the leading largest landlord, uh, and has a subsidiary invitation homes, which it manages with all the rental housing of Blackstone. And so basically all of Black, all of invitation homes, um, and you can see on this map not very well, but just some of invitation homes, homes in California, they're getting managed through this prop tech company called Yardi, which outsources all of this labor to Romania. So if tenants in the US use one of Yardi's platforms like Rent Cafe, um, which is very prolific in New York, San Francisco, et cetera. And if a tenant has a problem like with their washing machine or they can't get into their house, they call what they think is a local person managing their property, but they're actually calling somebody likely working the night shift in Romania. Um, and so this is how I learned about PropTech. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of it, including Tiemann. Tiemann outsources a lot of his work to Eastern Europe. Um, so there's a global dimension to it that we don't often think about. Um, and what's, what caught my attention in Cluj is that the infrastructure where this outsourcing is taking place in is sitting upon the ruins of former socialist era factories, um, and which you can see here, and leading to the displacement mostly of Roma communities from the city center. And this was part of my, my dissertation project was looking at how as Cluj revitalizes and becomes this sort of outsourcing hub, um, a lot of tenants, many of whom are Roma, are being squeezed out and, and made to live in the urban kind of peripheral wastelands. So there, there's this entanglement between the exploitation of tenants in this small town in Romania that many people have never heard of and um, all of Blackstone, Invitation Homes, property management in the US. Um, so that's how I <laughs> began thinking about this and it's, that's where I'm continuing to try to do work. Um, uh, but these tenants have been resisting. Um, there have been a lot of protests led by this group that I'm, I'm affiliated with in Romania called Casociala Cum, Social Housing Now. Um, and they've been doing amazing organizing work. And meanwhile, here in New York, tenants at Atlantic Plaza Towers, this is Trinea, who's one of the tenant, uh, lead tenant organizers, have also been fighting back. Um, and this is a recent city council hearing in, in New York um, that successfully uh, now has thwarted Nelson from implementing this facial recognition technology. So there are ways that, that pushback is alive and well. Um, I think one of the, the places that we need to do more work is um, uniting these different struggles, which are often very isolated and, and not thought of as connected, and yet they very much are on a material level. Um, which, which brings me to you. Um, the question of how, so if, if property technology um, is being implemented, in, in a very literal transnational way to, to facilitate housing injustice. How do we think about technology projects to bolster housing justice? Um, and that's really um, the question that's animated the work of the anti-eviction mapping project, which again, I've been a part of since the beginning in 2013, which I'm now gonna pivot to to show you some of what we've been doing. Um, and well, actually, before I do that, I. I do want to just note that we're not the only ones doing that. I don't want to pretend that we are. Um, these are just some images of a variety of really amazing uh, tech data housing justice collectives, some of which are in New York, such as Just Fix NYC, the Housing Data Coalition, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a great tool called Own It that's made up by a group named Sage in Los Angeles. Um, there's this great prop called Property Praxis, that's based out of Detroit. So we're one of many groups, and I'm not gonna get into all the cool groups now, but I just don't wanna continue pretending that we're the only ones that are doing this. Um, we began again in 2013, um, really uh, during this moment when 
um, we were seeing this surge of evictions uh, take place in San Francisco, very much connected to the birth of the tech boom 2.0 era. Um, so probably folks know this, but the dot-com boom in the Bay Area really bled into San Francisco in a very visceral way in the late 90s and early 2000s, in which real estate speculators started taking advantage of a lot of new wealth being generated by Silicon Valley um, and evicting long-term poor and working class tenants to create housing for this kind of new wealth flocking into the area to work in Silicon Valley. Um, some of that petered out when the dot-com boom crashed um, and then you know, the foreclosure crisis and then not following that we had this era that now a lot of us refer to as the tech boom 2.0 which we date as beginning in around 2011, 2012. Um, and what we began to see was the surge of evictions correlate with this boom. Um, this was the very first map we made. We made it um, when a few of us, none of us had any background in mapping. We just realized we needed to make a map to understand where evictions were happening because we knew that a lot of folks in our community were being evicted. Um, we sat down in the San Francisco Tenants Union, which technically houses the anti-eviction mapping project and thought it would be really easy just to make this one map and then we were gonna be done and that would be our project. Um, what we wanted to do was figure out who was behind all the different evictions and figure out if there were serial evictors that maybe were enacting multiple evictions at the same time. Um, we did make this map that shows, um, these are all, this is one particular type of eviction in California. Um, I should back up. There, there, there are two major types of evictions that, that take place generally, fault evictions and no-fault evictions, particularly in rent or, or rent stabilized, or rent controlled cities, um, such as New York, um, also San Francisco. Um, rent control in San Francisco and a lot of cities that have rent control um, in the US achieved rent control uh, after a lot of tenant organizing in the late 70s. Um, so 1979, in San Francisco, 1983 in Oakland. Um, and rent stabilization or rent control means that rents can't go up more than a certain increment every year. But uh, the real estate industry didn't like this and pushed back. And so in California, we have these two statewide laws, the Ellis Act and Costa Hawkins. They only pertain to California. But what that means is that landlords can bypass particular uh, protections offered by rent control to tenants um, and evict tenants for no fault of their own. Um, so what we began to see was a surge of Ellis Act evictions in particular in 2011, 2012, um, and many of them were being enacted by LLCs and shell companies, not the actual names of um, the evictors or the owners of those shell companies. So what we began, we began to see was that like surrounding tech infrastructure, but also in neighborhoods where there were a lot of Google buses, which are these private tech luxury buses that facilitate reverse commutes to, to um, Silicon Valley from San Francisco, we began to see a lot of evictions accumulate in those particular areas. Um, and so we really just wanted to know who was behind these evictions so we could better organize, right? Um, so you can see here, like, the sizes of these dots correlate with how many units were evicted. Um, but many, many of these are not actual names, but, well, some here are names, but there are many that are just LLCs, like, yeah. So it's hard to figure it out. So that question of who's, who's evicting whom and who the serial evictors are has continued to animate our project. And although we made this map and thought it was great, we realized that there was so much more we needed to do and that the question we were trying to answer wasn't fully addressed with this, this one map that we made, which was you know, nevertheless helpful. But still, there was, there was much more we could do and, and try to understand. So we soon started making maps that better correlated um, for instance, Google bus stops, tech bus stops with evictions. Um, we found that 69% of no-fault evictions occurred within four blocks of tech bus stops. Um, we also realized that by producing the kinds of maps we began producing, we were, uh, we were missing a lot of nuance in terms of stories of resistance and, and also just stories of displacement. So we began um, this, this narrative wing of our project that we call the narratives of displacement and resistance. Um, in which we produce oral histories and video pieces with people who have been displaced or who are um, fighting displacement, sorry, um, to, to better understand what's going on in particular um, neighborhoods and, and with particular struggles. Um, so this is 
continued to date. And I think what's been really nice about this narrative component to our project was that it brought in a lot of folks who weren't necessarily drawn to, to data analysis or cartography, but were more oriented towards the humanities and social sciences. And so it, our project is not, we're not affiliated with the university. Some of us are academics, many of us are not, but those of us who are academics are coming from a lot of different fields, which has been, I think, really the result of us opening up this narrative component to that project and producing, for instance, murals. Uh, we made this mural in collaboration um, with a bunch of tenants uh, whose stories we've collected uh, in the very first iteration of our oral history project and um, invited them to participate in creating a mural and having this dedication for the mural um, in this alley, which is a very kind of famous mural alley in San Francisco. Um, we began doing work that involved projecting narratives on buildings and creating sort of feedback loops in urban space so that um, we, could, we could be in dialogue again offline, online, and kind of create these hybrid spaces between the two. Um, yeah, we also began working with housing clinics that collect different kinds of data than the data that we had, would, we had previously been able to access. So that first map that I showed you, it, it has rent board data, and so the cities with rent control often have rent boards. Some rent boards are more forthcoming with their data than others. Um, so just for example, San Francisco and Oakland both have rent control. San Francisco's rent board did give us their eviction data, which we were able to analyze. Oakland refused for two or three years, and we had to um, write a number of record requests and actually threatened to sue the county until they finally gave us their data. But whether we get data from the, co the county courts or um, from the rent boards, it is it's pretty bare bones. Maybe it will be the date of an eviction and an address, possibly the type of eviction, but that's it. So we don't get any information about who's being displaced. And we don't want to have any information about anything that could be used to identify a tenant. But we did want to understand um, the demography of displacement and where people were ending up after they were displaced. So we began partnering with groups um, such as the Eviction Defense Collaborative, which represents about 90% of all tenants whose evictions go to court in San Francisco, to, um, to understand client um, intake data. Uh, so here we can, this is the map we made to figure out where people ended up after being evicted in 2012. We followed up with them in 2015. Um, we were able to reach about 500 people, so it's just a small sample set, but as you can see, it shows us um, movement within the city. Um, we can also understand um, the demography of who's being displaced. We found with this map that 300% um, of, of um, well, sorry, that, that black tenants in San Francisco are overrepresented by 300% when it comes to who's being evicted, which is huge. Um, and so that data that is really important in understanding the, the racist nature of the displacement crisis. Um, but we were also able to figure out where, where folks were going um, when they were kicked out of, of San Francisco um, and even um, who ended up uh, homeless and, and who passed away as a result of eviction. So this is a different kind of data than the data we'd previously been getting. Um, yeah, after a couple years of pressuring Oakland and Alameda County, which is the county that contains Oakland for its eviction data, we were finally able to get some. And so we produced this very lengthy interactive report with a number of community partners um, to, to kind of display that data in a way that we thought made sense and to entangle that data with other data sets. So um, this is Alameda County. Um, so we have video pieces. Um, we have uh, data that different um, uh, students collected in their, their schools. Um, we have narrative space, or nar narrative work. We have maps about public spaces that have been lost. Um, we even have a, a community power map, which we produced with a local um, art gallery in which uh, tenants could come in and put on the map spaces of power and spaces of, um, that they consider to be com community assets so that we could start thinking about space, not just in this negative way, but also as a site of uh, power and resistance. Um, and then we digitized it, which is um, what this map is. But it's this, this huge like online interactive report that we made um, that I think really gets, I think this sort of report really highlights 
the ways that we, we work with community partners and we don't really make reports for sure alone. We're always working with other groups um, and really trying to uh, maintain some sort of um, horizontal approach when we do that. Um, yeah, we began to also analyze, um, we wanted to still better understand who was benefiting and, and who was kind of taking advantage of, of the displacement crisis, if you want to call it crisis. Obviously, it's, it's more than that. Um, so we started, for instance, looking at um, the loss of single residency occupancy, or SRO hotels in Oakland. And um, one of the really, I don't know how to describe this, but um, do folks know what SROs are? Like, generally, right? They're, they're, yeah, a lot of tenants who are in pretty precarious situations live in them. But in, in Oakland, a lot of them have been flipped and converted into what are now being called like tech dorms or, um, or just fancy hostels with German beer gardens on their roofs. So we began this project to really investigate what's going on with them. Um, and both Oakland and San Francisco have experienced a surge of houselessness as of late uh, for a variety of reasons. But one of them is that a lot of SROs are being shut down um, and really after being kicked out of an SRO, there's nowhere else to generally go. So we started looking at that and the increase of houselessness um, as part of this project as well. Um, yeah, and it was around this time that we began new work in Los Angeles and New York. So each of those chapters operates relatively independently. They're, they're autonomous chapters, um, but we do share platforms and tools and technology. So in LA, Folks began this new um, narrative project, which they called Tenants in Common, that they, they made in collaboration with a few tenant groups there, which features various forms of oral history work. Um, and they also began doing a lot of work to understand the implications of uh, sweeps as they're, they're being used to target houseless folks in LA. Um, because we have this LA chapter, we've been able to do more statewide work and, and really examine what's going on across the state in terms of struggles for rent control. Um, really, it's been, although we, we've had a lot of uphill battles that often feel like they're losing battles in San Francisco because we're fighting these two big real estate, well, the real estate industry and the, the tech industry. Statewide, there's been a lot of organizing and a lot of tenants uniting and um, rent control actually being passed. So we've been doing a lot of work with statewide groups such as Tenants Together um, and Homes for All to really understand what's going on across the state and um, how we can better um, gain rent control in particular cities. Um, yeah, I'm just going through a lot of our work right now. But, and there's, we have a sub-project in San Francisco that I haven't been a part of, but other folks have. Um, that's called Dislocation Block Exodus. That's been really documenting um, black experiences of gentrification in the city. And their goal was to produce a zine, but it ended up being 147 pages, <laughs> which is now online, um, and you're welcome to take a look um, later. But we just released this um, two months ago and recently made a, um, an interactive digital humanity platform that highlights all of that work, too. So that's been an exciting kind of new addition. Um, but most of what I've been working on has, again, been trying to continue to ident identify who these serial readers are and make that more accessible and palpable for, for tenant organizers on the ground. Um, so in addition, so this is a map we, we made of all the Wall Street landlords in California, which includes Blackstone and Invitation Homes. Um, Blackstone's recently merged with these other huge Wall Street companies like Colony and Waypoint. Um, and again, they're the largest landlord nationwide. Um, so, yeah, they operate through a number of LLCs, but what we found was it's actually not so hard to figure out where their properties are because often they use the same mailing addresses to register their properties. So this was a huge thing for us to realize, and we were like, oh, we could implement this to kind of figure out, um, to better analyze serial evictors that are not maybe black stone scale, but still large serial evictors um, in San Francisco and Oakland. Um, so for instance, this guy, William Rossetti, um, he is currently Oakland's top serial evictor. Uh, he has a number of LLCs, which you can see here, um, much like one of these Blackstone kind of companies. Um, and of those, all of these on the left have issued eviction notices, making him uh, Oakland's top evictor with over 4,000 notices, um, eviction notices. Um, 
Yeah, since 2008. And this is excluding a couple years that we couldn't get data for from the rent board. Um, so we, we began making pages like this. Um, Veritas is currently San Francisco's largest landlord and becoming uh, quite a serial evictor. And you can see on the right, again, all of their, their LLCs. Um, and yeah, they've been behind uh, only 20 units evicted, but they've been harassing a lot of tenants out of their buildings unofficially. Um, so we're also able to figure out who's funding them. Um, there's a group in California called First, or sorry, uh, called the California Reinvestment Coalition who's been able to put pressure on some of the banks that have been behind um, evictions, such as First Republic, which we identified as disproportionately funding evictors. So that information's been useful. Can you walk us through how you tie the LLCs to specific landlords? Yeah. So, so we do a few different things. For one, we, we look at where owners, so there, okay, there are like three different data sets that we're trying to merge all the time. Um, one is the eviction data we're able to get from various cities or counties. The other is just property parcel information, right? Like who owns what parcel. But then the third is um, business registry data. So we look at different states, California mainly, to understand um, what businesses register, what names with, with the state. Um, that data is often very hard to, to parse through. Um, there's, there are tools like Corporation Wiki that um, are basically funneling that data into a more interactive platform, so sometimes we use that. Um, but we're currently in the process of, uh, I guess I'll just get, skip ahead slightly. Um, da -da -da. We're trying to automate this process <laughs> with our, this new tool that doesn't exist online yet, so you're, you're seeing our like, very data version right here where we're trying to um, merge these different data sets um, through what's called a relational graph database. Um, so that one of the problems is that the corporation data is so weird and complex. There can be an LLC that owns an LLC that owns, I don't know, that, that is the manager of a different LLC. It's very strange. Um, so we wanted to be able to relate these different data sets. But if you think of a traditional um, relational database. They're basically these more, uh, I don't know, like just tables, right, that we, we merge different columns or different data um, through unique identifiers, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're able to do with the graph database is really understand um, the, the weird connections. So that's what we're trying to automate right now. But when we began doing this work, we weren't using a graph database. We were simply looking at where um, the, the businesses registered their um, their mailing address and then group properties together like that, which is exactly what um, Just Fix NYC, which is another really amazing group here that our, our New York chapter partners with. That's how they um, have been able to create their, their tool that identifies owners by just looking at owner mailing addresses. One thing we were finding was that while that works a lot of the time, it definitely works with the, um, the Wall Street landlords. There are some landlords such as Veritas who might share a PO box with somebody else. And so we didn't want to falsely accuse somebody else of evicting if they didn't. And so that's been one of the things that's been hardest for us to parse through. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to not only look at mailing addresses, but um, also kind of use this, this graph database structure to look at different relationships between LLCs. Um, this is not my, I'm not a graph database person. There are other people in their project who are, I've been learning, um, but it's a really, there's this, um, library called Neo4j that we've been using if anybody's really into databases or wants to geek out on that later. But um, but yeah, so for instance, like I could look up, um, let me just look this up, like a, an address here, oh, I have to log in, sorry. Um, oh, it's, I don't know where it's loading. Let me try it, I'll try it this way. So there's this um, company called 55 Dolores Street LLC that uh, evicted 55 Dolores Street in um, 2013. They're the shell company of a bigger company called Urban Green, which I mapped out here once when I threw out my back and couldn't move for <laughs> a whole week. I, I used Little Sis, which is um, a great open source 
um, project that allows you to look at corporate connections. I use their tool to create this kind of web of relationships to better understand urban green. So, um, so to just show you here, uh, Urban Green's an investment company in San Francisco. They're a subsidiary of a bigger company in Colorado called Cornerstone Holdings. The CEO of Urban Green is this guy, David McCloskey. The CEO of Cornerstone Holdings is his father. But um, all of these purple, darker purple circles are properties that a particular LLC, such as 55 Dolores Street LLC, um, purchased and evicted. The more magenta, I don't know if you can quite see, but the magenta circles are properties that they've purchased that they have not yet evicted, but perhaps they will. Um, you can see that they're getting fund. Some of them are getting funding from First Republic Bank. Um, I, I sort of dorked out on this and wanted to follow um, political contributions and was able to figure out all of these connections to both the Democrat and Republican parties, mostly Republican, and the Aspen Institute, which is this Republican think tank in Colorado. Um, and was even able to make weird connections to like the New York City Police Department, which, and you know, all the way up to David Koch and Trump, if you if you go far enough. But, um, but what's useful for some, what was useful for me in doing this was to identify points of pressure that we could apply in fighting some of these evictions. So, for instance, um, after Fifty Five Dolores Street got their eviction notice, one of the women who was being evicted was at the time 97 years old. Um, she's since passed away. But it became a, a sort of national story because we were able to apply pressure um, and, and kind of create this campaign that the McCloskeys were evicting a 97-year-old woman. But we were able to get some, some friends in Colorado to go and also you know, um, hang billboards and petition outside of the offices of Cornerstone Holdings. And we could have worked up the web even further, but eventually um, they decided to withdraw the eviction and give her a lifetime lease, but she only lived a couple more years while all of her neighbors got evicted, including her caretaker. So it wasn't like an ultimate success, but, um, but that's sort of the, the point. That's kind of what we're going for with identifying these webs of connection. But the thing was, it took me um, probably about a week to build this from hand by just looking up all of these different LLCs, um, all of the parcel information I could find, the eviction notices, da da da. So what we've been trying to do is find a way to automate this, and we're not quite there yet, but <laughs> that's what our Victor Book Tool is trying to do um, with our graph database. Um, and it's not fully working yet, so look out for it. I think we're gonna probably release it to the public early next year. Um, but it shows you all of the parcels that are related through the, the various corporate connections. Um, but what's one of my favorite parts of it is that it also shows you kind of the web of connections and lets you play around. This isn't fully, this is, doesn't have a complete data set yet, which is why it doesn't look like the one that I made. But the, <laughs> the goal is that it will, and it will let users um, kind of, yeah, play around and, and better understand all of these weird connections um, so that they can organize accordingly. So um, that's our Victor book tool, which is by far the most complex thing we've tried to build so far, and it's required the most work. Um, we're considering like how it would be really great to model this out in other cities, but this kind of gets back to the, the ethics question that I want to sort of end on. Um, so it's... Um, we, we, when we began, there weren't many groups doing this. Now there are a lot of groups doing this. Some of them are totally amazing, but we've had some trouble with some bigger groups trying to kind of scoop up and absorb our data and use our work um, in a way that is maybe not as ethical as it could be. Um, so the eviction lab, Matthew Desmond's eviction lab in Princeton, um, tried multiple times to get our data from us without any sort of um, yeah, any sort of conversation around data ethics, how our data would be protected, what he was going to do with it. Um, it. As we found out, he was doing this, not just him, but his team was doing this to some other groups across the country, too. I mean, we've had conversations since then, and I'm not just trying to make him, like, the enemy here, but it's kind of become this weird landscape in which eviction data itself has become this commodity as these groups have kind of populated and gotten a lot of funding. Um, we, we are not funded, so that's not really our concern. 
the eviction lab is massively funded by, I don't know, MacArthur money, Ford money, Facebook money, da da da. Um, and with that comes a lot of incentives to grow and expand and now become, I think, an international mapping project that they're trying to do. But what we found was that because they're not rooted in like on the ground struggles and they're not rooted in community, the eviction lab produced this map of evictions in California that really undermined the problem and didn't include the data that we had um, because we, we didn't give it to them because we weren't quite sure about them yet. But what they were able to use was one of these data broker companies, these prop tech companies, to get their data. And, and um, it really undermined the scope of what was going on. But of course, their project has a lot more validity than ours because of just, I don't know, Princeton, big money, da da da. So it becomes this weird kind of conundrum, right? Um, there's this, this project in Detroit currently called Land Grid. They've changed their names multiple times. They used to be called Love Land. But I think before that they were called like we should own that, and they um, they're also proprietary and offer parcel data for anybody who wants to buy it. But they've really positioned themselves as like there to help um, I don't know fight displacement in Detroit. But really, they're when they started they were they started this guy started them um, with this idea that this tool would help people just buy up parcels really quickly and that if they could better map parcels and they could people like this guy could buy parcels and take advantage of what he called like the urban blight problem of Detroit and now they're themselves very proprietary and offering like again if you want to pay like a hundred thousand dollars you can get access to their national data set um, which kind of goes back to the prop tech like core logic right <laughs> and all of that stuff but there are these groups now that are positioning, positioning themselves as on the sides of housing advocates, but really, I don't know, it, it becomes this, this kind of strange conundrum. Um, and it's, it's strange that it's so hard for us or hard for Just Fix or any of these other groups to actually produce data that just simply connects a parcel with um, an eviction and a landlord. <laughs> like that's really, again, like going back to our very first map, that's all that we're really trying to do. Um, but. Yeah, the data is expensive, the data is proprietary now, and the, these corporations know that it's strategic by, um, that by using all of these shell companies and LLCs, they can maintain anonymity, which makes it harder to, to protest them. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where I wanted to, to lead us into having a, a more dynamic conversation um, and kind of what we've been struggling with as a project I always say that our end goal for the project is to just become an archive of a problem that is no more, but the problem persists. Um, and I think there are these other projects that are out there really to um, promote themselves, that are driven by capital, ego, et cetera, um, that are now suddenly sort of undermining the work that we're doing and that other groups are doing to, um, yeah. And just, I mean, when we began, there weren't so many, um, web mapping platforms that are so prolific now, like Cardo and Mapbox, and um, I mean, there was ArcGIS, but there's also this, this proliferation of, of web mapping softwares too that are proprietary now that a lot of people think that they need in order to make maps like this. Um, and so they're also kind of, they're supplying the landlords with mapping technologies and tools. They're also sometimes supplying us with mapping technologies and tools. Um, but it gets kind of tricky and it gets hard to figure out where to draw the line and producing the most sort of ethical <laughs> mapping project that, that one can. Um, yeah, so I wanna, I wanna leave it there and open it up. Does that sound good? Yeah, any, any thoughts or questions? I know I just threw a lot of information at you all. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, really our website is where we're trying to make everything that we've made that's for the public available. Um, we recently reorganized it so you can filter by topic and location now as we've added more locations. Um, yeah, and again, like, in thinking about scaling out that tool, it's like we're, we're kind of coming up against that. Like, we don't want to just pretend that this tool is going to work for everywhere. Um, 
we are now like rooted and on the ground in these three different locales, LA, the Bay Area, and, and New York. So we're, we are hoping that that tool will be able to, um, to roll out in those three different cities by really understanding the landscape and understanding the data landscape and the housing landscape, which can be messy and there are lots of groups and relationships and organizations. Um, but yeah. <laughs> and I'm curious to know if you have any contact with people who work in, I'm thinking of San Francisco, of people who work in there and whether they are aware of that and are they seeing something? Is there something like that? Yeah, uh, people who work in tech. Like, yeah, why are you working with people who work in tech? Apart from you doing potentially things like activism and tech support activism and yeah. grassroots organizing. Yeah. I mean, we're in an interesting moment where there's a lot of organizing happening in tech right now um, in a way that I've never seen before. Um, most of it, of course, is being done to kind of think about tech's relationships with ICE, with sexism, um, with, with climate injustice, et cetera. I feel like there's still a lot of work to be done within the big tech companies to, to make folks aware of the gentrifying impacts that their companies um, produce and that they themselves often are implicated in. Um, and so, I mean, often what we tell people is there are so many housing organizations that already exist that need more support and need people to plug into. I think there's this idea in tech that we always have to create something new and often these groups just need people to join and show up and, and be bodies or people on the street. So that's often what we tell folks. Um, and there are so many groups to plug into, including in Silicon Valley itself. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious in, about uh, if you have any demands uh, coming from your work and from the community work about what kind of data should be made more available. Um, so I'm thinking of redlining where you know, part of the organizing work to get met with these public data, yeah. many data. So if you had something similar that you wanted, um, what would you I mean, we are often demanding that um, LLCs like have to register their, their entire ownership system with particular cities, not just with the state. Um, and that when they do, they have to be much more transparent. Often they're just registering a managing officer and not the actual owner right now. Um, I think having more transparency around that would be huge, um, as it really is mostly right now LLCs that are buying up properties. Um, yeah, and then just, I mean, evictions in general, we can get eviction data, like I said, in cities with rent control in California, which are less than 20 cities in a state with, I should know, but <laughs> hundreds of cities, but not thousands of cities, right? Um, so right now, there's no mandate that that eviction data be, be made public or available anywhere, and often you have to have a lawyer that you're you know, writing record requests with in order to get that, and da da da. Um, so that's, a, that's another data set that we would love to see made available. Um, I mean, really what we're trying to produce with this Evictor book tool, we would just love that data be, to be made available and accessible by different municipalities so that we're not the ones having to do it, but that's not about to happen any day soon, but yeah. Yeah. Are there any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. yeah <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, so we ourselves are not policy advocates. Um, we do make policy recommendations when we work with community partners. So in some of these reports that we've made, for instance, we often will have policy recommendations, but we are always careful that we're not the only ones leading those recommendations um, because that's not really our expertise per se. Um, but in our Alameda report, we, we definitely have recommendations that we produced with tenants together, which again is a statewide group in California. Um, that does do policy advocacy. Um, we do write academic articles. That wasn't our goal originally, but what happened was some academics started writing articles about us, and we were like, no, you got it wrong. So, um, so we did start doing that. I've done quite a bit of that myself, um, often in collaboration with one or two other uh, folks. Um, 
and then we write a lot of more just like public press type of articles and work that does not exist behind paywalls and that's for us that's really important um yeah so there are, there are different platforms um we have now two zines that we've made one is that black exodus scene we have another one we made back in 2015 um which is smaller though it's still kind of cumbersome and next year we're going to be releasing our first ever book which i, I didn't talk about but um it's going to come out with pm press it's called counterpoints we've been working on it for like four years <laughs> Um, but it, it will have seven chapters. Each chapter is edited by a team of different people in their project. Um, I've been involved in two of the chapters. And that book has been a way for us to also challenge ourselves to, to build new relationships um, because we wanted to think more broadly around displacement and resistance. So we've been working with some uh, indigenous organizers for the past three or four years and we're gonna have a chapter in that book on indigenous geographies um, and resistance, and we have a chapter on environmental racism that we've been producing with some folks involved in public health struggles and environmental racism and justice struggles. Um, there's a chapter on like policing and state violence and gentrification. So it's kind of interesting because um, generally we make maps that are digital uh, and not for print and not necessarily for through, like graphic design based mapping, but for this book we've had to kind of change modalities and, and bring in some folks with that sort of expertise. And it turns out it's a lot harder than I thought to convert a digital like online interactive map into something for print um, because we, it's hard to compress the kind of, well, the interactivity, but also the temporality. Um, so that's been, it's been exciting, but also a lot of work, but hopefully we're, we're in the process of doing a lot of fundraising for that because we want it to be affordable. Um, so we need to raise a lot of money by next year so we can keep it at around the maximum $20 range. And we'll have like a free online version too. So. I, have, I have a comment or a question maybe more to Tyler. It's So there are different ways. So for instance, in that mural that I showed you, um, we made sure to, to highlight narratives. They're just five minute clips. So there's a call the wall feature on this mural. There's a phone number you can call when you go by it and hear these, these narratives. Um, they're just five minute clips um, in English and Spanish. Um, and uh, again, the idea is to distill what's otherwise an hour long oral history into something shorter. And most of them are way, stories around ways that tenants have successfully fought back and won. Um, we also include this story of Alex Nieto, who was killed by the San Francisco police um, in 2014. And these are his parents here. Uh, actually, these are his parents, um, Elvira and Refugio, who, um, who painted his portrait, which is right here. Um, but we wanted to include him because he was killed after a, a few gender fires in San Francisco, racially profiled him when he was on his lunch break and called the cops who um, fired 72 bullets within a couple of minutes and killed him instantly. Um, and the police department, um, the, the particular branch of that police department is across the street from this, this alley. But anyway, so we, we wanted to really make that palpable and known to so that when anybody walks by this and calls that number, they hear immediately um, about his story. Um, yeah, I think like with the, the tenants in common, um, let's see, this, this platform, it's a little bit more digestible maybe than our um, kind of more <laughs> geospatial map, uh, which 
this one you really have to search through. There's not a great way to be like, oh, I want to hear a story about X, Y, and Z. You, you, we kind of intentionally wanted it to be something that people had to, to traverse themselves and get lost in. Um, but we wanted, with, with the Tenants in Common project, to make that a little bit um, easier for a viewer. And just to, to show you <laughs> by Zuma, we got the stories in LA, um, but we are now gathering stories in New York. Um, there's a separate URL for the New York one, so you don't have to do this. But <laughs> um, there aren't as many stories yet, but we're slowly um, producing them with some, some tenant orgs that we've been working in community with here in New York. Um, and speaking of which, we've also produced this worst evictor list um, of, of New York, so you're welcome to check that out. Um, we were able to, to break down the worst evictors um, by, uh, by borough, um, but also um, look at them NYC-wide. Um, and so you, you can see here who those kind of worst players are, like the, the sort of equivalent of Veritas and Urban Green in San Francisco are, are these people here in New York. Um, and just uh, several weeks ago, um, we had an evictor tribunal um, with the Right to Counsel Network, which has been kind of acting as a way to kind of bring together a lot of groups throughout the city to put on a mock trial um, to hold these evictors accountable, where all the tenants who have been um, subject to har harassment and eviction by them were able to testify. Um, and again, it would, the actual evictors weren't there, and the judges were, um, were really friends uh, of the housing movement. Um, including one judge who was part of a similar tribunal that took place in 1970, put on by the Young Lords. So yeah, this isn't the first time that something like this has been done. Um, but yeah, and I recently realized too, just because there's been this kind of looking back at the, the sort of decades after the world, uh, the WTO protests in Seattle in 1999, but that, you know, indie media came out of that movement, right? And the Indie Bay is the Bay Area version of of indie media, but one of the very first things that indie media did when it formed in the um, early 2000s was to put together a list of the 45 worst slumlords in San Francisco. So, so yeah, we're definitely not like the first to do this, um, and it's cool to kind of learn about those histories and try to make sure that we don't forget them and that we we stay in conversation with the people who really were doing this decades before. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, it's very, generally it's very organic, but um, we have in New York, for instance, we have monthly meetings um, where maybe we have about 12 or so folks who show up um, and talk about the various projects that are going on here in New York um, and make decisions together through a consensus model. Um, we were, so it's interesting, like in, the whole reason really that the New York and LA chapter started was that we had folks in the Bay Area who were from New York and LA and or who were moving to New York and LA. So everybody who kind of started those chapters was already plugged into the Bay Area chapter before. So they were able to transmit kind of like organizational knowledge and politics and ethics really. Um, but they were both also very intentional when they started those chapters, not to just like go in and start a chapter, but like spend at least a year just supporting and, and showing up to um, the work that other groups were doing. So I think that kind of gets at how we've approached um, being really slow to produce work um, and really not wanting to step on toes because obviously there are a lot of groups in New York doing amazing work um, and the same in LA. So it's been, yeah, it's been a slow moving process that's really prioritized the relationships and not the, the work that's being produced. Um, and in the Bay Area, I think because we kind of emerged out of the Tenants Union, which has been around since the 70s, um, and as part of various coalitions, um, 
There's a coalition called the Anti-Displacement Coalition in San Francisco, and then the Regional Tenant Organizing Network that kind of unites groups regionally throughout um, the sort of Bay Area, broadly speaking. Um, I think it's been, that's made it a little bit, we're, we're one of the groups in a network that generally um, is comprised of housing nonprofits and like legal organizations. Um, so really, even though we're not a nonprofit, um, I think our allies are generally people who do like base building work with tenants and not necessarily um, like funded tech projects. So it's, it's kind of a different, yeah, <laughs> a different affiliation with, with funded organizations. But um, yeah, we have gotten funding sometimes to produce specific projects. Um, so it's not that we're opposed to getting funding. We just don't have paid staff and we haven't prioritized like making that our model. So at times we've gotten funding to, um, to do particular projects and we'll often divvy that funding up amongst the people working on those projects. And yeah, we're always talking about maybe we do need to, to restructure to have some more cohesion in terms of, um, I don't know, just like some of the behind the scenes work that kind of it takes to, to keep their project going, but that's just never been really the priority and it seems to work without that, but it's, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's an experiment, um, for sure. Yeah. 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 So my, my question is around the behind the scenes work. Yeah. I'm curious about how you approach maintenance of the, like, every, the seemingly, seemingly ever expanding web mapping. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, it is a lot of work, and I think that's one of the things I've been really realizing as we've been growing, <laughs> is um, for every map we make, you know, if there's a timestamp on it, and within a few months it's not going to be completely up to date anymore, or, or as relevant as it could be in terms of updating it with eviction data. Um, so we're trying to find a better way to, to make that happen. Um, in the three different cities right now, it's a lot of just kind of this whole list of record requests we have to do on a like monthly or quarterly basis, and then kind of updating the various maps with that data. Um, yeah, it took us quite a bit to, we, we, we restructured the website so that things were searchable um, by theme and location as we realized suddenly we, we didn't want the new New York and LA work to get lost in the sea of San Francisco based maps. Um, that was pretty hard too because we didn't want to lose existent URLs because so many of them are in various articles or reports and da da da. So we had to, um, the restructuring was a lot harder than we thought, but I think we have a more sustainable way to do that going forward. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of work and um, yeah, it's, it's an experiment for sure. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Or, oh, yeah, two. Oh, no, no, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, I guess so this is kind of related to those first two, but like, um, I'm wondering about, you talk about like creating these data sets of like for different kinds of people like, is super valuable and like you kind of you want to share it with certain people and you don't want to share it with other people. Can you talk about like how you manage making those decisions as a collective? Like, yeah. In particular, if you're making steps to like prevent the data sets that you are the stewards of and all you like, yeah that's been a really that's been one of the hardest questions for us um so there are a few things for one um with this evictor book tool we've been having a lot of conversations like do we want it to just be password protected and only distribute it to other people within our sort of like anti-displacement network um or do we want it to be made available to the general public and the fear that people in the network, we've, we've been having conversations with other organizers and they're like, well, we don't want this to get into the hands of the real estate industry. But then on the other hand, the real estate industry has a much more robust set of tools and data sets than, than the, what we have. Like they basically already have this. We're just trying to um, to kind of shift the, the presentation of it to, to shine light on them rather than um, on speculative um, property. So I think that's gonna be okay for us to make public, but in terms of like the ability to download eviction data sets, that's, that's something that we've been struggling with too because we want that to be available. We've been worried about that getting into the hands of the landlords, but the more that we realize that they already have it, the less 
worried if we are, but we definitely don't want any identifiable information about tenants to be used against them. That's been a really important thing to us, and that was what we wanted to have conversations with Desmond about initially that we never were able to have. Um, for instance, our oral history map, um, right now the, the stories that pop up on it are, um, they're not archived anywhere other than on our site and unfortunately with SoundCloud, <laughs> which is what we're using right now. But, um, but we have access to that and we can, we can take a story down or put a story up. When we first launched the oral history project, um, we learned that one of the tenants who we've been working with, he was um, a friend of one of the other people in our collective, we had an, a whole narrative that was about their fight, their eviction struggle. Um, we found out that the landlord, um, their landlord had a lawyer that found that oral history and decided to use that in a, the court case that was ongoing against them, which horrified us because it was like the last thing we wanted to do was to produce um, narrative work that would be used against a tenant, right? So we, we have right now this double consent process that we've designed with tenants that they consent to their story going online um, and we, before we even put it up, we need them to consent again that it's okay, that they're not in the middle of any sort of ongoing court case or investigation and that they know that at any moment they can write to us and we will take it down instantly. Um, so that's been like an important thing for us to design and a reason why we've not archived oral histories with um, a more formal archive that we wouldn't have as much control over. Although now I know there are some really radical archival projects that would let us have that control, but yeah, that maybe that's something we'll do in the future. Um, but yeah, it's sort of like a, an ongoing learning process um, because a lot of the data is really sensitive and yet some of it when it's um, abstracted slightly and kind of without the identifiable information can be really important to make publicly available. Um, but yeah, it's, it's weird. <laughs> it's a weird question and problem to, to try to figure out. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Is anybody working on any sort of similar project here? Or like is it, I mean, similar in terms of identifying landlords or mapping evictions or, yeah. I know that there are lots in New York, and I'm still learning. Kyle is working on some projects. Yeah, not that young. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. You'll learn a lot more about prop tech from her. She's She's more of an expert than me, but it's been fun working with her, so, yeah. I've been working with a colleague on um, trying to map displacement uh, into the shelter system in New York City. Oh, yeah. See which uh, community districts are experiencing sort of the highest rates of displacement into the system. Okay. Um, we've been trying to, uh, we've gathered the data, we've spoiled the data a while ago, and we're trying to update it, and the HR is like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. So that's one of the. Uh, yeah, well, that sounds really important. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting these different municipal governing bodies and the data that mm -hmm. they have or they don't have. Um, with the the prop tech stuff, like we've been asking that the city, well, we, the tenants. And in Atlantic Plaza Towers have asked for a moratorium or a ban on facial recognition altogether. Um, some policymakers have been pushing for a policy that would require the city to at least have a registry of all the deployments of facial recognition and automated decision making. And yet, um, like the technology branch of the city do it has claimed that they don't have the capacity and that maybe it should be DBI and then DBI is like, no, maybe it should be HPD and da 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 da. And it's, it's kind of this ongoing, like nobody wants to, to create that very, I think, not so difficult to, to produce or maintain um, data set. And, yeah. To me, it's like really interesting how you mentioned that, um, like these kind of surveillance technologies are really installed in the very kind of high end, like residential areas, yeah. and then also the kind of, and on the kind of the polar opposite, the like the public housing 
Yeah, exactly. How they're being different in the Right, right. And I and I wonder like um, what are the um, like what are the like incentives for installing these is the main incentive for installing these of any technology like just like easier ways to evict um, to evict residents so that they can like, raise yeah. rents or That's is it just kind of like, um, like standard like police surveillance? Yeah, I mean, so the landlords say that like their their incentive is to increase safety, but sure. right. So, but in, for instance, Atlantic Plaza Towers, there are currently seven different cameras that tenants have to walk through already before they get into their apartments. And that's even before the facial recognition because public housing has so much surveillance already, um, right? And so much policing. Um, and the tenants will say that they have a lot of complaints that they raise in their tenant association meetings, um, like broken heaters or um, infestations or whatnot, but safety is not their concern. It's, it's I think, often used, um, discursively used by landlords in order to kind of speculate on the tenants that they hope to have in the future. So that's what a, a lot of the tenants in Atlanta Plaza Towers have said, like, this is not for me, this is to kick me out so that new people will show up um, who want this technology, who aren't threatened by this technology. Um, yeah, with Tiemann and the gate guard, I mean, his, his, the letter he's been sending out to landlords explicitly states, like, if you install this, you'll be able to better um, surveil your tenants and evict tenants and raise rents and da-da-da. So I think I think that is often the incentive of the landlord. Um, and do tenants often like have, like, do they know about these technologies before they get installed, or there's like a plan? Like, what, how does the decision make? Happen? It's yeah, it's different all the time. So the Atlantic Plaza Towers first, like a this really weird survey went out in the mail to a lot of tenants about like check this if you like this or that. And that was supposed to be around like whether or not they wanted this installed, but it was not transparent that that's what was coming. Um, and that got some tenants worried. Um, that mailing only went into some tenants' mails, mailboxes because already the landlord had implemented a system that for tenants to have access to their mailboxes, they had to send a photo of themselves in. So it's like, again, this isn't, the, the stone log would be new, but there was already this very robust surveillance regime in place that involved um, cameras. Um, but yeah, so when the tenants got that weird mailing, they were like, this is strange, and they started organizing, because they already have monthly tenant association meetings and doing research. They began working with Brooklyn Legal Services, um, which is now um, representing a few different buildings that, that have been fighting this. Um, and yeah, just they started working with some of the researchers at AI now, but other other organizations as well, to to kind of understand what you know, I don't know, heat scan facial recognition even is. Like I I had no idea that that even existed. And so yeah, but they're very in, well informed, and they've already been organizing around other issues in the building. So I think that made them really good um, organizers. And, and yeah. Um, but they've been amazing, those tenants. And that, that particular case reached the national level. Um, Yvette Clark um, you know, proposed a policy amendment that would prohibit facial recognition in public housing in the US, but it's unlikely that's gonna pass, but that came out of their organizing. Um, so, yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. I, I think in a lot of the team in properties, they're more high end and people might might like them so Yeah, I think that they're, 
relatively standard based on the companies. There's so they're different companies, right? So this is the GateGuard one that um, our team had made, and I think they're all relatively similar. With like you know, landlords can maybe alter some some sort of specific ways that it's used, but it's the same kind of piece of hardware. I think of the same with this FST21, which is already being deployed. Um, and this is the Stonelock one, um, which is called a Stonelock True Frictionless Solution. That's the way they, they or frictionless solution, yeah. Um, and that, it's funny, actually, a lot of the language around this is around safety, but also frictionlessness, which is like the new buzzword at these prop tech conferences, which is so strange because it's actually really hard to say, but, uh, but people are often talking about how this is going to create a sort of frictionless future. Um, but yeah, I think that this is already being deployed, I believe, in another building in the Bronx. Um, and the only reason we knew about that was that somebody living in that building was friends with one of the people in Atlantic Plaza Towers and let them know. And then the Atlantic Plaza Tower tenants have been doing a lot of work to kind of educate the folks where this has already been deployed. So even though it's this big victory with Atlantic Plaza Towers, it's like already out there in the world elsewhere. Um, but yeah, this particular technology is very different than this one, which is different than this one. But, um, and this is the one that's being used in some of the more high-end places. But um, yeah, as far as I know, but yeah, I, I know that according to Tiemann, this is being deployed in 700 locations in New York, but he could just be saying that. I, I haven't figured out where those locations are yet. That's what I'm trying to know figure out, but there's no incentive that he disclose that because there's no requirement or anything like that. Um, and the same with all of these companies. Uh, or even that weird Poo Prints thing. It's like, um, Poo Prints has said that they're being used in 100 buildings, but at this moment, there's been, it's been impossible to find which buildings they are. Um, but hopefully that will be easier with more research, but that's kind of what, <laughs> what I'm trying to do now. Because like these facial recognition efforts can like really poorly detect like people of color or like women, do you have any sense of like whether or not they were like tr like more trained towards people of color and like the in Atlantic um, in Atlantic Plaza and like if No, I mean we just know like generally if we look at the algorithms that facial recognition use, like I mean they're they're being trained with these sort of um, labeling systems that we now prioritize the faces of white men. Um, but with, I don't know how that works with heat mapping or motion detecting per se. Um, that's kind of like, that's gonna require some more research. <laughs> but, um, but you know, scholars like Ruha Benjamin have said, like the point is not to suddenly train these algorithms with more like women of color faces. The point is to like abolish these, these systems. Um, but at the moment it's, it's not lost on the tenants that it's not designed with their faces in mind um, or with them even living in those buildings in the future in mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have other questions? Um, okay, well, I guess we are. Are we? Do you, okay. Yeah. yeah. And if anybody wants to get involved with the mapping project, please let me know, and, and you're welcome to join. So, yeah. yeah. Sorry if you covered this, oh, no, no, but no, no, no. how much yes. is this technology, do you think, um, can it be used to sort of like, because for rent like tenants, they have to be in an apartment for like more than half a year and things like that. Yeah. Do you foresee sort of the use of this technology to sort of like trap tenants okay. or people in there? Or, or just sort of use data that might not be just using data against yeah. like red protected tenants? Yeah, like that. that's what it seems like. Yeah. The idea is that like if they can, if, if particular violations can be detected, mm -hmm. then that's grounds for displacing them. So I think a lot of it's looking for like, oh, they brought a friend in that they weren't supposed to bring in, or they like, um, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Thank you.